Phenomenal. See, this is the difference between Black Star Network and Black owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black owned media and be skate. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? December the 21st, 2023. I'm Dr. Greg Carr, sitting in for Roland, who is taking a much needed vacation. Here's what's coming up on Roland Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. Folks want Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, Clarence again, to recuse himself from upcoming cases centered on Donald Trump's efforts to overturn the 2020 election results. We'll tell how one Democratic senator made his case for Thomas's recusal. The co-founder of Moms for Liberty gets blasted by a college student and a Harvard student to boot during a recent school board meeting demanding her resignation. We'll show what he said in a now viral video. New York is the third state to create a reparations commission. I'll talk to the director of the Reparation Education Project about why the United States should look closely at reparation. And it's the winter solstice, the shortest day of the year in the Northern Hemisphere and the beginning of winter. With that comes seasonal affective disorder. If you don't know what that means, don't worry. We have a doctor here to help. She's gonna explain what it is and how to avoid it. We'll also have Roland's one-on-one interview with award-winning gospel artist, Doe. She'll explain how she started singing God's praises. It's time to bring the funk on Roland Martin Unfiltered, streaming live on the Black Star Network. Let's go. He's got whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. A Democratic senator wants Chief Justice John Roberts to compel Associate Justice Clarence Thomas to recuse himself in cases related to Donald Trump. And if we look at the upcoming court docket, that's quite a number of cases. Senate Judiciary Committee member, Connecticut Senator Richard Blumenthal, wrote a letter to Roberts explaining why the Supreme Court of the United States ethics rules deem recusal necessary if a judge's impartiality, quote, might be reasonably questioned, end quote. Blumenthal wrote Thomas is ethically compromised given the political, public political activities of his wife, Jenny, you think? 
Uh, this is the letter we see on screen here. Mrs. Thomas had, has been deeply involved in former President Trump's attempt to overturn the most recent presidential election, including by attending the January 6th rally, whose other attendees later stormed the Capitol, sitting on the board of an organization that led the Stop the Steal movement, and sending dozens of text messages urging White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows to prevent certification of the election results, end quote. Blumenthal noted that Thomas recused himself in the January 6th related case earlier this year. We're going to talk about this, Clarence Thomas and his uh, latest hijinks, with our panel. We have our sister Lauren Victoria Burke from the Black Press USA, coming out of Arlington, Virginia. Turin Walker, brother Turin Walker, from, the founder of Context Media of Atlanta, out of Atlanta, Georgia, and also out of Atlanta, Georgia, John Quell Neal, a trial lawyer with the John Quell Neal firm. John Quell, why don't we start with you, sis? Um, in the hallowed halls of the Supreme Court, John Roberts has been slow to act on a number of things. How do you read this latest request of the Chief Justice by the uh, Senate, at least the Democrats on the Senate, to talk to Clarence Thomas about potentially recusing himself in, the, in these cases? I mean, I think it's a very reasonable request. I mean, essentially, with his wife's involvement in attending the January 6th incidences upon the Capitol that's been involved, how his wife has intricately been involved with the uh, President Trump's administration, um, I think it is reasonable. I think it rises to the level of a conflict. And I think it's a reasonable request that he should consider. Okay, well, I mean, we know politically may be different than the, the legal reasons to, to recuse himself, and it certainly does seem reasonable on its face, at least. Uh, Torin, you um, uh, keep your ears to what's out there in the street and how folk are talking, and you're engaged in a number of ways with a number of different communities on conversations related not only to what's going on politically in this country, but how people are interpreting this. How do you interpret this call, and, and how, do you, uh, how relevant it is or irrelevant to you know, our conditions as black folk in this country? Well, you know, I think the call to recuse himself is a valid um, call. As far as, like, the way people are um, thinking about this on the grassroots level and on a political level, I think what it's really going to do is it's going to open up the floor for people to pay a lot more attention to how the judicial process works in this country, at least on the level of the Supreme Court. As far as, like, what that really means for people who are on the ground, I don't think it's going to affect that much, but what it will do it's going to make people understand that uh, if you are entrusted with a sacred trust, as far as like uh, on the Supreme Court or even in the political process, that there are certain procedures that have to take place if you're going to be given that trust and you have to honor that no matter what your status is. And I think that's where people are going to be focused on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Lauren, you not only covered the Hill for a number of years, I mean, but you've seen the political ebbs and flows and you've seen uh, this justice on this court and in the context of how the court's makeup has changed, particularly over the, uh, the, the course of the Trump presidency, help us put this in context, if you can. Uh, what's your read on this politically? What, what are the politics behind this, and how might this? People are saying that this, this latest court docket uh, may be the most significant and perhaps even more significant than the Bush v. Gore decision of 2000. How, how, are, how are you reading this? I think that Clarence Thomas, we can't expect him to do anything or change anything. And obviously, it's reasonable that he would recuse himself. Uh, this topic has come up before, but the way that the Republicans roll right now is that the rules and do not apply to them. Uh, I think they want to keep up this idea, and particularly Clarence Thomas wants to keep up this idea that no rules of ethics or anything else applies to him. I can ignore all the complaints. I can do whatever I want. I'm not sure John Roberts is particularly interested in changing anything. And I don't think they want to set any new precedents that would, uh, you know, make them in any way uh, have to change their ways, change what they're doing, change who their friends are, and change any of the ethical standards that other judges around the country have to uh, uh, scum to and have to pay attention to. But the, the, the modern Republican Party is not interested in following any rules, and they are extremely interested in showing everybody that the rules do not apply to them and they can do whatever they want. So I'd be extremely, extremely surprised if anything changed. You know, it's interesting, if you don't mind me following up, uh, Lauren, with you on that, and I know that the Colorado case, the case uh, taking Donald Trump off the ballot, was discussed extensively earlier in the week here on RMU. But, you know, I, I think I, for one, would like to hear your take on that in this context, because I think you're right. John Roberts 
certainly uh, wants to at least project the appearance of legitimacy of the court, and they continue to erode it. Do you think they can push this too far? And maybe even, it's certainly the, the, the concept of legitimacy of the court is really teetering for a lot of people in this country, but could they go too far? And is Roberts out of concern? Might he perhaps speak to Clarence Thomas? Not that anything would change, but do you think John Roberts, particularly with this hot potato that's going to land in their lap around this Colorado issue in the 14th Amendment, do you think that, that he might be a little nervous? Uh, not really. I mean, they probably, for all we know, have probably had some sidebar, some private sidebar that we don't know anything about. Uh, but, you know, their whole game, again, is that the rules don't apply to them mm -hmm. at all. You know, the idea that we're going to have elected as, or the Republicans would nominate somebody who, uh, under the, under the definitions of treason, uh, hovers close, if not exactly on top of that definition with what happened in 2021 at the U.S. Capitol, you know, they're not interested in, in anything other than controlling the game, power, and winning the next election. That's pretty much it. Uh, I'm not sure why anybody would expect anything from John Roberts. I haven't seen anything that would make me think that <laughs> he's going to change anything. And certainly we shouldn't be expecting anything from Clarence Thomas. I mean, absolutely nothing. Because, again, this has come up before in other cases that he should recuse. He, he's, he doesn't recuse himself. He never recused himself. No. The, the justices that were picked by the Democrats are always recusing themselves for one thing or another. They never do that. But that's on brand for this modern Republican Party, that we just ignore rules, we do whatever we want, and we control things, and then we ignore, you know, the hypocrisy of any moment. So, you know, uh, I, I think also there's a fear, quite frankly, of Donald Trump's supporters. So the Colorado case comes down to them. Who is going to stop Donald Trump from doing anything. They're all afraid of Donald Trump. They're not just afraid of Donald Trump. They're afraid of the people who support Donald Trump. So I don't see anything changing with that. I think they're going to rule in his favor, as a matter of fact. But we'll see. Hopefully I'm wrong, but we'll see. No, no, I think, and from everything I'm hearing, I think you're right about that. And even in terms of ruling in his favor, yesterday's New York Times headline, many voters see criminality but support Trump anyway, is really un right. underscoring what you're saying. Um, and I've been, you know, talking to some friends, some lawyer friends, and some law professor friends, some of the scuttlebutt is that they think that they might even rule eight to one to restore Trump to the ballot and just basically run over Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, and that it might be uh, an opinion that is co-written in some ways by Kagan and Roberts, but that the one dissenter will be the person who appears to be emerging as the defender of the 14th Amendment, as we could expect, Kataji Brown-Jackson. But I guess we will see. Uh, Jack Well, as a member of the bar who's in the courtroom, in and out, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how this kind of rogue behavior on the court that is suborned by a chief justice, because there are no rules that they are bound to in terms of ethics, I'm wondering how that echoes through the bar. You as a lawyer, appearing before judges every day, fellow members of the bar, even other judges who might be concerned, who are held to ethical standards. I mean, any, any sense of how this might reverberate in the courtroom, the day-to-day -day courtroom where our people are every day, where you're in there fighting for us every day? Yes, certainly. And as it relates to um, Justice Tom, uh, Thomas recusing himself, right, there has to be some showing of actual bias or impartiality, right? And so some of the factors that are considered when a judge recuses themselves is the judge's personal knowledge of the facts in dispute, hmm. right? The judge's relationship to the party or counsel, um, and whether or not his impartiality that might reasonably be questioned, Um of that judge and their relationships. And so if, in fact, what starts at the head trickles down to the bottom, right? So if we have, I mean, the SCOTUS, uh, the Supreme Court of the United States, is held to the highest standard, right? And so if, in fact, that if we're having rogue behavior or those that are not showing um, ethical behavior, then that's going to trickle down to all the other judges that serve in our various jurisdictions, right? And so... Um, I think that that has a great, can have a grave impact um, on the court system. Absolutely, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. One, one more question uh, in this, on this story, uh, Torin, and this is for you, brother. You know, you're one of the most engaged folk I know who are talking with and having conversations around folks about electoral politics, what's important, what's unimportant. 
Here we have a situation where uh, uh, a chief justice, an associate justice, are on a court where you've got a majority that was appointed by um, a, a party that has lost the popular vote in most of the recent elections. Um, and then you got folk who will say, well, it doesn't really matter who the justices are, don't matter, uh, who's in our office, the Democrats or the, or the Republicans don't matter, it doesn't affect my real life. What would you say to somebody who would say that and would say, I don't even know why y'all covering this story because it doesn't matter? Well, I think what people have to understand is that, you know, the things that you don't pay attention to are the things that really affect your life. Mm -hmm. You know, our people come out as a rule for like presidential elections and we come out when, it, when it's time to talk about voting. But what we don't talk about enough, in my opinion, is the fact that some of the things like a Supreme Court decision or even a local decision or your state decision, these sort of things are the things that affect your daily life. And you have to pay attention to every facet of what happens in your government, because if you don't, things like this can happen. And we don't understand that some of the things that we think are happening to us have repercussions outside of the state of where you live in. Whatever happens in California, you may, may come to see you in Atlanta. Whatever's happening in New York may come to see you in Miami. All these things are connected, and what we don't understand, and I think, well, I don't want to say we don't understand, but something that we don't talk about enough is the fact that people on the opposite side of the aisle, people who are the alt-right and the right-wingers, they are very good at playing long game. They are excellent at it. Whether we agree with them or not, they are very good at sitting back and planning their strategy 20 years in advance. What's what, we're, the common, what we're seeing right now is the culmination of things that went on in the 80s and in the 90s. It was a slow crawl up to this point. And I think that's what has to be made um, clear to people so they can kind of understand how these things play out. It's not what's right in front of your face. It's the things that happen down the road. No question. No question. And when we come back after the break, we're going to look at an example of someone at the local level who's going to take on something that has emerged on the national level as part of that long range movement in the right wing. This is Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network, and we'll be right back. I'm Dee Barnes, and this week on The Frequency, we talk about school to prison pipeline, book bans, and representing for women's rights. The group Mom Rising handles all of this. So join me in this conversation with my guest, Monifa Bandelli. This is white backlash. This is white fear that happens every time Black people in the United States help to walk the United States forward towards what is written on the paper. Right here on The Frequency on the Black Star Network. Next on The Black Table with me, Greg Carr, the enigma of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. What really makes him tick and what forces shaped his view of the world, the country and black America? The answer, I'm pretty sure, will shock you. And he says, you know, people think that I'm anachronistic. I am. I want to go backwards in time wow. in order to move us forward into the future. He's very upfront about this. We'll talk to Corey Robin, the man who wrote the book that reveals it all. That's next on The Black Table, only on the Black Star Network. I'm Faraji Muhammad, live from LA, and this is The Culture. The Culture is a two-way conversation. You and me, we talk about the stories, politics, the good, the bad, and the downright ugly. So join our community every day at 3 p.m. Eastern and let your voice be heard. Hey. We're all in this together, so let's talk about it and see what kind of trouble we can get into. It's The Culture, weekdays at 3, only on the Black Star Network. Farquhar, executive producer of Proud Family. Bruce Smith, creator and executive producer of The Proud Family, Louder and Prouder. And you're watching Roland Martin. Welcome back to Roland Martin Unfiltered here on the Black Star Network. And in Florida, Moms for Liberty co-founder um, Bridget Ziegler, whose husband is under investigation for raping a woman, is being asked to resign from the Sarasota, Florida school board. During a recent school meeting, a school board meeting, 19-year-old Xander Morix blasted Bridget Ziegler for her anti-black and LGBTQ plus policies. Let's take a listen. Bridget, our first ever interaction was when you retweeted a hate article about me from The Nationalist while I was a Sarasota County School student. You are a reminder that some people view politics as a service to others, while some view it as an opportunity for themselves. On this board, you have spent public funds that could have been used to increase teacher pay, to change our district lines for political gain, remove books from schools, target trans and queer children, erase black history, and elevate your political career, 
all while sending your children to private schools because you do not believe in the public school system that you've been leading. My question is why doesn't an elected official using our money to harm our students and our teachers for her gain seem to matter as much to us as her having a threesome does? Bridget Ziegler, you do not deserve to be on the Sarasota County School Board, but you do not deserve to be removed from it for having a threesome. That defeats the lesson we've been trying to teach you, which is that a politician's job is to serve their community, not to police personal lives. So, to be extra clear, Bridget, you deserve to be fired from your job because you are terrible at your job, <laughs> not because you had sex with a woman. Well, there it is. And to be clear, her husband, Christian Ziegler, has not been charged with a crime, but he was removed of uh, his uh, position as the head of the Florida Republican Party recently. Uh, his wife, uh, Ziegler, isn't showing any signs that she's going to resign. Moss for Liberty arrived on the political scene with angry protests against school masking requirements during the COVID pandemic. Let's bring our uh, panel back to have this conversation. Uh, Turin, we'll start with you. Um, Moss for Liberty burst on the scene. They seem, I don't know that they've peaked yet, but they're certainly uh, quite vocal in all kind of things, banning books and no mask mandates. And, you know, and, and, and as we just heard, you know, many of them don't have children in public schools, but they seem to be terribly uh, invested in controlling what goes on in the public schools. Uh, what does this stand? I'm thinking about this in the context of what you just said before the break in terms of involvement at the local level, not in addition to just state and federal level. What does it say for a young person to, to make a statement like that at an open school board meeting? And any thoughts on what that means in terms of even getting involved in kind of pushing back against some of this clearly very highly coordinated stuff going on? Well, you know, the first thing I want to say is that there's a long history in this country of people who believe like the Monster for Liberty being hypocrites. Um, if you go back to the 50s and you go back to the 60s, we had Dixiecrat senators and we had Dixiecrat governors in some cases who would say hateful things about, um, you know, black people. And you come to find out down the road that they either had a whole separate black family <laughs> right. or completely different thing they said they believed in. So that's the first thing. You know, we know the stories, Strom Thurmond. So, you know, these things happen. As far as on the local level, I think it's also a good example that this hypocrisy does not extend just on the federal level. What I would like to see, though, I'll be honest with you, is more African Americans who are based in Florida who are on a grassroots level and people who were just regular citizens being able to get into these city council meetings and have, make their voices heard as well. Because, you know, the young man talked about, you know, some of the anti-LGBT key issues, EQ issues they have, but they've been very vocal and very aggressive about removing certain books out of libraries in Florida and across the state. Some books that are not even, even that so-called threatening, like statements about Martin Luther King, books by Malcolm X that they consider radical. And this is, again, this is something that we've seen a historical precedent happen across this country. In my opinion, I feel like the Moms for Liberty are no different. They're like a reincarnation of the Daughters of the Confederacy and the mm. League of Decency, where they use like their white privilege and their white and their white woman privilege to be able to create a moral panic to get their men involved and make them get more aggressive about how they enact their white supremacy. So I think that's the connection that needs to be made on the local level. Yes, absolutely. You know, it's interesting, uh, Lauren, in the context of Moms for Liberty. I'm glad uh, Torin talked about the, you know, looking at this almost like a later iteration of the Daughters of the uh, Confederacy, who, which of course we know are still around, right down the road from you in Virginia. And in fact, uh, their headquarters, I want to say, is it across from the uh, Virginia, Virginia Museum of Art? But anyway, you know, there's been some recent reporting that says that Moms for Liberty is itself going through some convulsions, some internal convulsions. Is it possible that in a moment like this, this type of hypocrisy that Duran is talking about might just be a, a force them toward another, a form of reckoning? I mean, could Moms for Liberty be in trouble or, you know, how should we read this? I doubt that they're in any trouble. They, uh, you know, they're just another version of the citizen councils or the citizens councils of, uh, of the 1950s and 60s, in my view, uh, this idea of always trying to control what people are being taught or the school system, the public school system, while, as mentioned, they've got their kids in private school. Uh, that, that always seems to be the case. You know, it's funny, in Virginia, there were several uh, school board races that actually, uh, they were beaten back. Yes. Um, and that was, you know, that was, I think, a little surprising to a lot of people. But the, the difference is in, that in... Uh, Florida, 
you have a governor, Ron DeSantis, that really gives a lot of fuel to their fire. Uh, even though it's the case in Virginia that there's a Republican governor named Glenn Youngkin, uh, and he ran on the CRT, the sort of false CRT notion, he doesn't push it anywhere near as much as DeSantis. So, uh, at any rate, this is sort of the same old ball game. It's another iteration of the same thing we've seen in American history before, right around the time that Brown v. Board happened. And, you know, what these arguments come down to, as they all come down to, is controlling what other people are, what people's kids are reading, what they're taking in, what they're learning. So a huge obsession over that uh, with the quadrant of the Republican Party. And I doubt that they're going to run out of steam. In fact, I think they're going to get louder next year as Donald Trump starts to, uh, you know, win primaries. And um, I think they're going to get louder as he continues going forward. Hmm. You know, it's interesting, uh, Jacquel. I don't know if, if any of you remember, you might remember Jacquel. Right there in Georgia, I know there was a sister who came down, I think from Maryland, who was in, uh, appointed to run a school district, and they put together a right wing push, took over maybe some school some school board seats and ran her out of the state. Um, clearly, this isn't, and none of this work is about substance or about concern about the the learning, to, the education of our children, but, but as as we just heard Lauren talk about, it's really pop political. Um, any thoughts on, particularly since you are, you and, and Tarana, deep behind the cotton curtain, about how this is playing out in uh, local school board elections? As, as, um, as Lauren said, they lost school board elections there in Virginia. And of course, Georgia um, certainly has, whether it be Atlanta or Augusta or Savannah or some of the, the places, Columbus, where it's majority black, you see black folk in control of those school boards. But um, should we be paying closer attention to these school board races and to these kind of incursions where people are trying to control the curriculum and, and try to control what our children are, are learning in school? Yes, you're absolutely right. Um, I, I think that we have to be paying very close attention to the um, local uh, school board elections, um, researching our candidates and being more active in these grassroots opportunities. Um, as it relates in Georgia, I mean, there was in DeKalb County not too long ago, there was who was elected over the school board. They were trying to remove her more recently from her seat. Um, and she's an African-American woman and she, and she had to fight for her seat to keep her seat on the school board. And so, um, in order to make sure um, that our children are receiving the adequate education that they need in the public school system, we absolutely have to be paying closer attention to our local um, elections. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, we'll continue to monitor Moms for Liberty. Uh, they're not going anywhere, but then neither are we. So uh, when we come back from the break, we're going to turn our attention to reparations. Uh, we've got another major story. This might be the biggest story in terms of reparations commission to come down the pike yet. Uh, the New York, uh, uh, the New York State, uh, the New York Senate, State Senate, and uh, the Assembly House, the Assembly delegates have voted, and on Tuesday, the governor of New York signed a law that is creating the third reparations commission, study commission, in this country. So we'll talk about that after the break here on Roland Martin Unfiltered here on the Black Star Network. Back in a moment. Grow your business or career with Grow with Google's wide range of online courses, digital training, and tools. Gain in-demand job skills with flexible online training programs designed to put you on the fast track to jobs in high growth fields. No experience is necessary. Learn at your own pace. Complete the online certificate program on your own terms. Stand out to employers, get on a path to in-demand jobs, and connect with top employers who are currently hiring. Take one professional career certificate program, or all six. Earn a Google career certificate to prepare for a job in a high growth field like data analytics, project management, UX design, cybersecurity, and more. All professional career certificate programs must be completed by December 31st, 2024. Scan the QR code to complete the application. There are 1,000 scholarships available. Grow with Google and J. Hood and Associates. Be job ready and qualify for in-demand jobs.
Lee Shepard, and you know what you're watching, Roland Martin Unfiltered. New York is the third state to consider reparations. Governor Kathy Hochul signed legislation creating a nine-member commission to study the effects of slavery and to make non-binding recommendations on reparations. This group, consisting of three members appointed by the governor, three by the assembly, and three by the Senate, will issue recommendations in the next two years that, quote, may include compensation, end quote, but can also include statutory and policy remedies for reparations. Um, I was actually there in New York uh, earlier uh, this week to, to bear witness, and when I walked in, I was very happy to see my friend and colleague uh, there uh, in Kichi Taifa, who I'll introduce in a minute. We'll talk a little bit more about the commission. The commission's gonna be convened within the next six months, and after that, they'll have a year to draft their report. From there, the legislator uh, can act upon the recommendations. Now, joining me now is an in, in attorney in Kichi Taifa, a long distance fighter in the reparation struggle. You've seen her on the black table. Uh, you'll see her again. Uh, she is a presence in all of these conversations, nationally and internationally. She is the director of the Reparations Education Project. And Kichi, welcome to Roland Martin Unfiltered and welcome back to the Black Table and everything else that takes place here uh, on the network, Black Star Network. Welcome, sis. Thank you so very much, Dr. Greg Carr. Always glad to be in your company. And I was just uh, in, so enthused to be in your company earlier this week in New York at the New York Historical Society for that historic Reparations Commission signing. Yes, ma'am. Will, will help us because as we were sitting there, you were helping us with the history, putting it in a little bit of a context, uh, reminding folk that California was not the only state to have a commission, and in some ways that New York's commission might differ from both Illinois and California and be historic in its own right. Could you put this in the context with a little, a little, uh, a little bit? What, what does this mean? What does this bill mean? What does this new law mean? And what kind of things do you think can emerge out of this? Well, again, as you said, this is the third state commission to study and develop reparation proposals for African Americans. Uh, California was the first, Illinois was the second, and New York is now the third. New York is really historic because it really is a microcosm of what is going on in this uh, country. Many people say, well, why New York? Um, uh, wasn't slavery abolished in New York? But most folk don't realize and uh, understand that New York has been entangled uh, with the history of anti-blackness and white supremacy, and it must be reckoned with, and it must be repaired. One of the first and most active slave markets in America was on Wall Street, mm -hmm. okay? New York financial institutions such as Citibank and uh, uh, and the like, they profited massively off of enslavement, even after the abolishment of slavery in New York. Whether you were talking about mass incarceration, whether we're talking about redlining, whether we're talking about workplace discrimination or predatory lending, supremacist policies have been emanating from the same foundation as enslavement and Jim Crow uh, and the like. So the fact that New York has now stepped up to the plate is pretty uh, major. Many people think that um, uh, California being uh, the first state is setting the pace. Well, I think folks are going to see some reckoning with uh uh, with New York on, on the scene now. And uh, Illinois is just beginning to uh, get their commission set up. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and it's interesting because we, we talked about this yesterday on WPFW here at the Pacifica Station here in Washington, D.C., on your show, Human Rights and Justice. Uh, you know, how, you know, it was, it was really something to see the governor of New York speak for a half an hour, giving her own background from Western uh, part of the state as a white woman in white working class New York growing up and, and wanting to do this. And, and it was particularly striking to have the fact that both sides of the legislature in the state of New York are run by black people. Uh, Senator Andrea Stewart Cousins on the Senate side and State Assembly Speaker Carl Hastie, who spoke after her. You know, how important is black 
engagement in the political process, how important is that to what we're seeing unfold in New York in terms of black political participation? And finally, and we're thinking about the, our young sister, uh, Mikali Salages, who is of Haitian uh, descent, but who is also in the uh, state assembly, Assemblywoman Salages, who talked about the, the kind of diversity and complexity of New York State and the fact that unlike California and you know probably unlike Illinois or really any other state, New York is where the reparations conversation can't be one that is separated between the descendants of those who were enslaved in the United States and the Africans from all over the, the, the world, really, who live in New York, many of them over a long stretch of time. You know, how unique is New York? And how does those politics come into play in terms of what we're going to see unfold on this commission? Uh, well, first of all, let me say, if it weren't for black political participation in, in New York, in the Assembly, in the Senate, we would not have had that historic uh, signing uh, yesterday. It would not have happened on its own uh, with the governor. It was precisely because of the involvement and the advocacy of um, um, uh, of black members, uh, Michele Solange, as you mentioned, um, State Senator James uh, Saunders, uh, and the like, and actually predicated by the decades-long work of uh, Charles Barron, mm -hmm. uh, before uh, them, we would not have seen what we saw. But not just in terms of the political participation of uh, uh, people who are part of the political process, but the advocacy community on the outside had a whole lot to do also with ensuring, uh, as Frederick Douglass uh, says, that um, power concedes nothing without a demand. There was a demand for this signing to happen and to um, occur. And with respect to New York, uh, New York, as I said, is just a microcosm of the world. It's a microcosm of the global community. So we're going to see some really interesting uh, situations um, here between those who um, uh, expound the lineage-only um, um, a version of reparations and those who um, embrace a more comprehensive view of uh, reparations. It's going to be an uh, interesting uh, situation. Reparations is indeed an issue whose time has come. And for those of us like yourself, uh, Dr. Carr and myself, who've been on this road for a very, very, very long uh, time, all I can say is I just can't wait to see uh, the fruition uh, from the seeds that we had planted from Queen Mother Moy, Mario Bedelli, and the like, um, from the past coming to fruition today. Ashe. Yeah, I'm glad you, you, you raised the name of one of your great Jegnas and Louisiana's own Queen Mother Audley Moore, who was raised, of course, by Assemblywoman Solages uh, on Tuesday. Um, and like you said, the, the, the community was there, El Joy William, where Brooklyn at. L.J. Williams was there with NAACP. We saw Hazel Dukes, the state NAACP president, send a recorded message in. Uh, Laree Daniels' favor. We saw Congressman Bowman in the room. It's very important. I, I want to um, bring in our panel to, to, to ask you any questions or make any observations. And, Lauren, we'll start with you. Um, the state of New York, of course, is a little different than the other, every other state in the country, and certainly New York City may be distinct from other places. Any questions uh, for you for, uh, for, for uh, counsel here uh, in Kichi Taifa? Well, on the key, it's great seeing you. Um, hey, Lauren, how are you? <laughs> how you doing? Um, you know what, my my feeling. I, I've been. I was in New York uh, for the last four or five days, uh, and New York has been increasingly a, a difficult place to live. I was born in the Bronx. It's a very expensive place to live, to say the least. But w when I heard this, uh, the first thing I thought about was Executive Order ninety sixty six. Uh, and FDR <laughs> and the reparations given to the Japanese, which was 20,000 a person, I believe, under Ronald Reagan. Also, yeah. it came with a public apology. Um, and I just feel the first thing I thought of was, why are we studying this? Because there's not a whole lot to study other than the amount that should be given, in my view. <laughs> I mean, we know, of course, what African Americans have been through historically in this country. And so, do you take it in any way, the idea of a commission, do you take it as a delaying tactic in any way by the government, by Hochul or by anybody? Or do you take it as this is a success that we're just even talking about this, which I, I suspect you could take it both ways, because I remember the days when people laughed when this issue came up. And to me, the this issue is a serious thing now in a way that it was not only a few years ago. But But tell me what you think about commissions as opposed to um, quicker action. <laughs> so 
So, yes, Lauren, thank you so much for the uh, question. I mean, commissions has become essentially the precedent, the standard, I guess you could say, whether it was the Indian Claims Commission back in the day, whether it's, as you mentioned, the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, uh, which granted reparations to Japanese uh, Americans. And John Conyers, as you know, because I know you were walking the halls of Congress as a media <laughs> person during those days, uh, but John Conyers, um, following the model of the successful Japanese American Redress Bill, which started out with a commission to study and then develop uh, uh, proposals, that just seems to be the precedent. Is a delay? Well, I would just say, as someone who was around back then in 1988, when we were <laughs> working with Congressman John Conyers, there were many of us were saying, reparations now. We don't need a commission to study. We studied this long enough. But what we decided strategically was that if they could use that approach and do it for the Japanese Americans, there's absolutely no way in which they could discountenance our claims if we followed that same path. Unfortunately, the federal bill has languished now in Congress nearly 40 years, but the momentum has been bubbling up from the local jurisdictions. We talked about the three states, California, Illinois, uh, and now New York, but scores of city councils across the country have been establishing commissions and task forces to look at abuses in their own uh, backyard and to come up with remedy. So yes, we can say it's delay, but it's the precedent that has been uh, used, the standard that has been used. And again, if a uh, commission comes up with the evidence, with the documentation, with the uncontroverted reality in writing and paper of what has gone on over the past uh, 400 years, then again, it just makes the case even that much stronger uh, for remedy, for repair, and for amends. Absolutely. Thank okay, you, thanks. Lawrence. Yes, indeed. Uh, John Quell, any, any uh, conversation, questions, observations for Attorney Nkichi Taif? Yes. Hi. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I wanted to, you know, I'm also a fellow New Yorker. I, I was born and raised in upstate New York. So this is definitely an exciting time. Um, but I wanted to ask specifically about, you know, some of the historical disparities amongst African-Americans um, in New York um, over time. Um, for instance, an example may be the war on drugs, right, that disproportionately targeted African-Americans in New York, and they suffered police brutality or malicious prosecution as a result. Um, do you think that that could potentially be some of the recommendations that the commission comes up with? Or, or what do you think some of the specific uh, disparities, how do you think the commission will address some of these specific disparities that African Americans have endured all this time? Absolutely. Thank you so very much for raising that. I'm a family member of an organization called INCOBA, the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America. And part of our um, um, commentary on the whole uh, issue of reparations is that uh, we identified five injury uh, areas that needed to be looked at. Of course, the black-white uh, wealth gap but also the peoplehood, nationhood, the, the stealing and, and extracting of our, our culture and our history, uh, uh, health disparities, educational disparities, and, of course, as you mentioned, the disparities within the criminal punishment system. And it appears as if the different commissions that have been set up, i.e. California, use uh, many of that same criteria with respect to the recommendations that they came up and many of the other jurisdictions across the country that are looking in their own backyards and unraveling pieces of history are looking at those elements as well. So, yes, the criminal punishment uh, system is, in fact, on one area. I always say that the harms from the enslavement era and beyond were multifaceted. Multifaceted. Each one of these is not just the black-white wealth gap but it's so, so much more as well. Thus, the remedies must be multifaceted as well. So thank you for your question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Brother Torrin, uh, any questions, comments for uh, Attorney Taifa? Oh. Well, first, I want to say, you know, shout out to all the people who have been pushing this issue for the past 40 years, because this has gone from a fringe issue to a major platform plank that actual politicians have to really contend with. So my question is this. 
we've seen a lot of movement in politics in a, a, a lot of unusual states, California, um, Chicago, Evanston, and now New York. And you haven't seen so much movement in the places where the black population has been directly affected, like the deep south where I'm from. So my question is, do you think that this groundswell of um, legislation and this groundswell of commissions that are happening in other states is going to begin to have a groundswell in like the deep south? And do you think that every different jurisdiction is going to be able to put their own policies in place containing to the places that they're in? Uh, absolutely. I think that it will, in fact, have an impact on the Deep South. I mean, we have um, uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. That's not the South, <laughs> that, you know, the, the West, Midwest. But we also have um, Alabama, Africa Town, the site where the last known uh, slave ship deposited um, kidnapped African prisoners of uh, war. They are looking into issues of uh, reparations as well, or repair or amends, and the many uh, 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 legacies from the enslavement era are manifest right there, and that is right there in the Deep South. You have the Chattahoochee Brick Company down there in Georgia, in Atlanta, uh, Georgia, where Black folk were literally worked to death. Okay, when we talk about the vestiges from the enslavement era, and they're looking at issues of um, uh, of repair as well. Um, in, in Florida, we already know about Rosewood, um, Florida. Many of us know about that, where uh, a certain group of people did, in fact, receive uh, reparations as a result of the, um, uh, the decimation of uh, that particular community. Um, so, I, as I say, caskets are being opened up all across the country uh, with respect to uh, this issue. And yes, indeed, North Carolina, Asheville, North Carolina has established a reparations uh, commission. So it's not just in the North or the California or um, the Midwest. It's happening in the South as well. And we will only see much more of it as, again, this is an issue whose time has come. Thank you. Attorney Nkichi Taifa, long distance reparation fighter. Um, for folk who want to follow up and perhaps know more and follow you in your work, and not only that, but through you, uh, this continued reparations fight, how can people uh, stay in contact or get in contact with you and become aware of what you're doing? Uh, thank you so very much. I invite people to visit my website, reparationeducationproject.org. That's reparation without the S. Reparation Education project.org. You can follow me on Twitter, X, or Instagram uh, with my name, the Kichi Taifa. All right. Well, we appreciate you, sis. Thank you for, thank you for taking some time out your schedule, and uh, we're going to continue to monitor this and stay involved in this fight. And when we come back, after the break, we're going to stay in the city of New York with a person who used to be known by some crazy people as America's mayor. And we're going to talk about a little bit more personal brand of repair, uh, particularly the two black women who were defamed. And the court says that Rudolph Giuliani owes them close to $150 million. You can run, but you can't hide. Roland Martin Unfiltered will be right back here on the Black Star Network. On the next Get Wealthy with me, Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, did you know that 43% of Americans say that they're going to go deeper into debt because the cost of everything is rising because of inflation? On our next Get Wealthy, you're going to hear from money coach Lynette Kelfani Cox as she shares exactly what we need to do to stay out of debt and get wealthy. When I paid off my $100,000 in credit card debt, I was just doing strategies kind of piecemeal. I was doing like what I thought would work. And then it was like, oh great, it did. It, 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 it was effective. Um, and then I was like, I should document this. I should explain like how I got out of debt. That's right here on Black Star Network with me, Deborah Owen, America's Vote. On the next A Balanced Life with me, Dr. Jackie, beware the generational curse. They're everywhere in our families, in our workplaces, and even in our churches. It's like a minefield, identifying the curse and knowing what to do about it. When we're talking about generational patterns, oftentimes we get locked into those patterns because we don't want anyone to say, oh, you acting brand new. Are you doing something different from how this is how we always did it? It's okay to do something different in order to get the results that you want to see in your life. That's next on A Balanced Life on Black Star Network. 
Hey, it's John Murray, the executive producer of the new Sherry Surfer Talk Show. Be a watch and roll the mark. Unfiltered. Rudy Giuliani files for bankruptcy a day after a judge ruled for him to immediately pay $148 million to two Georgia poll workers who successfully sued him for defamation. In his filing, Giuliani listed nearly $153 million in existing or potential debts, including almost a million dollars in tax liabilities, money he owes his lawyers, and many millions of dollars in potential legal judgments and lawsuits against him. He estimated his assets to be between $1 million and $10 million. Ruby Friedman and Shea Moss. All right, sisters, wanted a judge to keep him from repeating the lies he spread about them following the 2020 election. The new lawsuit centers around Giuliani's comments during and after the trial last week, repeating the baseless conspiracy theories about Ms. Freeman and her daughter, Shea Moss. The lawsuit states that Giuliani makes it, quote, clear that he intends to persist in his campaign of targeted defamation and harassment. It must stop. Well, Rudy, 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 since we got two New Yorkers on uh, the panel tonight, I'm going to flip uh, something that uh, Senator Sanders said yesterday. He said he's an immigrant. He left the Deep South to come to New York. So we're going to go with the New Yorker who's back in the Deep South. Uh, John Quayle, can this man hide from this debt he owes these sisters? Or what, what, are we, what are we looking at here with this bankruptcy filing? Well, the, unfortunately, with the bankruptcy filing, um, if deemed to be a legitimate bankruptcy filing in terms of the actual amount of money that um, Ms. Freeman and her daughter are able to recover is going to be up to that bankruptcy judge. And essentially, um, they're going to go through all of his debtors, and, and then the court is, is the one that's going to make the final say. And so, unfortunately, yes, it, it does um, have a substantial impact on their ability to recover. But it's interesting because in the judge's um, sentence in the sentencing order, the judge said that he is that the court was vehemently against him constantly trying to weasel out of paying these young ladies. So it will be interesting to see how all of this is going to play out. Um, but the bankruptcy filing is, is, is unfortunate, but it's another tactic, um, as the court had a concern about that, of him trying to weasel out of paying these young ladies. Absolutely. Let me see, ask you a quick follow-up question. The way I understand it, he could ask for a stay on Hal's ruling, but in order to do that, he, he might have to post a bond in the full amount of the damages? I mean, that, that, that's not possible, is it? He's not going to ask for a stay. I mean, would, it, it, would he have to post a bond in some amount if he asked for a stay? He's claiming he's broke. That I'm, un, that I'm unclear about. I'm unsure about um, that, to answer that question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I just wonder, because you're absolutely right. By that order, that judge rained hot fire on Rudolph Giuliani. He's mm -hmm. been non-compliant. He's been, okay, that, that's very interesting. Lauren, you've watched and reported on Rudolph Giuliani for a long time. <laughs> what do you make of this latest development in the, in the long, <laughs> rapid decline of, of America's mayor, so to speak? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a, an amazing thing to watch. I can remember when he first, you know, I remember when he was mayor. I remember faintly as a kid when Ed Koch was mayor mm -hmm. uh, in a New York that is quite different than the New York we know now. Uh, he was credited with so much uh, improvement in New York, particularly the Times Square area of Manhattan. And then, of course, Rudy Giuliani was mayor during 9-11. And uh, I don't know what has happened to him. It's difficult to explain. I think some of it is that he really kind of got to a point where he unveiled his true feelings on race, which he had kind of hidden during the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s, and now he really doesn't care. So there was, there was that. Uh, and I think partly because Donald Trump just brings out the worst in everybody around him. Uh, to Rick Wilson saying that everything that Trump touches dies. Hmm. But uh, there were a lot of folks today that were saying that the bankruptcy, you know, that that he can't discharge this debt, this $148 million, he's not going to be able to waive that goodbye by filing for bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. 
certainly if it was that easy, everybody who is has gotten a judgment, a civil judgment against them would do that. They would file for bankruptcy five seconds after this type of a judgment. Uh, but he deserves every bit of it. He he lied about Ruby Freeman and Shea Moss and lied and lied and lied and lied. And I guess he thought that it didn't matter. And of course it did, uh, not only in a court of law, but uh, in reality. I mean, the truth matters and what you say matters. He caused them real damage and he lost. Uh, I also find it interesting that we live in a world where he is saying that he's bankrupt, but uh, he's listing his assets of somewhere between a million dollars and some other number over a million dollars. <laughs> Usually when people say they're bankrupt, they, they say they have no money at all, right? So uh, <laughs> right. I guess this is this is New York, you know, this is bankrupt by New York standards, you know, so he has a million dollars. Um, I don't know. I, I think in the end he's going to have to, he's going to get leaned, he's going to have to pay up, and I'm sure he owes a lot of attorneys a bunch of money. Uh, but it is a sad thing to watch. The man is 79 years old, and uh, it is incredible the sweep of his life from where he was when he was a prosecutor in New York and then the mayor of New York, and now this. He's aligned himself with Donald Trump and really made him made himself into sort of a clown, quite frankly, a figure of ridicule and a figure of uh, of, of really laughter. So it's uh, it's going to be interesting to see what's decided, though, and, and, and whether or not Ms. Freeman and Ms. Moss get see some money, which I think that they will, actually. We'll see. Absolutely, absolutely. It reminds me of that old song by Harold Melville and the Blue Notes featuring Teddy Prendergrass. Rudolph Giuliani seems to certainly be singing now, Where are all my friends? I'm like, well, I'm not your friends, man. But anyway, uh, Taryn, you, 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 you've you seen this up close. Uh, anybody who has, like all of us, watched that testimony from Ms. Freeman and Ms. Moss, you know, he's ready to fight somebody, man, when you see how these sisters' lives have been disrupted by this. And not just by Rudolph Giuliani, but all these minions calling the house, messing with Ms. Freeman's grandbaby, all kind of stuff going on. You know, any thoughts about this recent development and what this says about these attacks, particularly on black people? Because these two sisters certainly didn't deserve this. Nobody does. But particularly as it relates to how our people read something like what has happened. Well, I'm glad you framed it that way because these are the things that, um, if you take the humor out of it, you got to look at the real credible threats that happen when somebody like Rudy Giuliani or somebody like a Trump or somebody on the far right with a platform and a megaphone that big um, makes an accusation against somebody that's black because you know that there is this sort of like deputization that this informal deputization that happens where people who believe the same way they do feel like they need to take the law into their own hands to set yes. things right in their mind. So, you know, I think part of the judgment was part of the fact of acknowledging the fact that these women were really under serious imminent potential threat. You know what I mean? All it takes is one maniac with a rifle to show up to somebody's house after somebody's information has been put out there that's to right. do something horrible and leave a household des destroyed and leave somebody's life taken. And that's something that has to be considered as well. You know, it's one thing to say that this is ridiculous because these people are ridiculous in a way, but we can't discount the real clear and present danger people like this um, it can impose on especially people of color, especially black people, because we know that anytime somebody's black, a black person's life is threatened, there's always somebody willing to take up that call and try to act on that threat. So I'm glad it happened. It's just sad, as Lawrence said, watching his career arc have take it, take, went, go the way it did, because he first came to prominence as the as a New York DA that took down the mob, and then he became prominent as being the mayor in New York, you know, when 9-11 happened. I think some of that was just happenstance of just... Um, some of that was just left to chance. But to see somebody have a career arc go from somebody who was so credible to becoming almost a clown, to becoming somebody who almost looks like one of the people he prosecuted in the 80s is something to witness. It's a fascinating career arc. It's like the worst Wall Street um, sequel I've ever seen. Hmm. Well, I'm sure we all agree that there won't be many tears shed in black communities. Certainly there won't be any tears in Brooklyn for those who remember Patrick Doris Mine, uh, who remember Abbott Luima. There certainly won't be any tears shed for those who remember Crown Heights and him out there leading the police in chants that it's Giuliani time trying to take down David Dinkins. And there certainly won't be any uh, tears shed in black communities, certainly all around New York, as uh, the fact that he was never America's mayor as far as as they were concerned. So, um, but you're absolutely right, brother. And thank you for, for bringing that out because, you know, money can't repair your safety when you got a bunch of nuts still running out here. So we've got to always keep that in mind. Um, it's the shortest day of the year, as we said, the December 21st in the Northern Hemisphere. And a lot of people are affected by seasonal affective disorder. And we thought tonight on Roland Martin Unfiltered, we'd bring in a professional 
uh, doctor to help us talk about uh, what we can do to kind of combat that and blunt that. And so we're going to hear from someone to help us with that right after this break. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network, and we'll be right back. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause too long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037- 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zell is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Love King of R&B, Raheem Devon. It's me, Sherry Shepard, and you know what you watch. You're watching Roland Martin, Unfiltered. Today officially marks the winter solstice, the beginning of winter, and the shortest day of the year in the Western Hemisphere. Um, you mix all that together and it can create some difficult situations for people. You mix it all together and you can get seasonal affective disorder. This is a type of depression that occurs during the fall and winter months when there are fewer hours of sunlight. So we thought tonight that we'd spend a little time this uh, evening here in the Northern Hemisphere with a medical professional, uh, sister who has uh, done a lot of work in our community, not only around medicine, but about healing us. And so we're joined from Atlanta I'm going to stay in Atlanta for a minute by uh, a sister on the faculty of the Morehouse School of Medicine, Dr. Reba C. Kelsey, who is an associate professor of family medicine. She's going to help us dis uh, discuss this disorder. Welcome, Dr. Kelsey. Thank you, Dr. Carr. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Help us understand this. Now, I read a little bookshelf definition of seasonal affective disorder, but, but help us uh, understand what we're dealing with here. What is seasonal affective disorder? Seasonal affective disorder is, as you said, a type of depression that occurs uh, during the colder months or during the fall and the winter when we have less sunlight. Uh, it's important to think about um, seasonal affective disorder um, a little differently than perhaps some um, we may have uh, thought about it at one time. Some people would think about it as being the winter blues, just kind of feeling down during the winter time. But it is, in fact, a type of major depressive disorder. And so it has some of the same symptoms, or really the same symptoms that would uh, cause one to be diagnosed with uh, diabetes, or excuse me, with, with depression, um, including a decreased mood or feeling, feeling very sad, a decreased interest in doing things that they would normally do, a person would normally do, increased guilt or feeling of worthlessness, uh, uh, decreased energy, uh, increased appetite, particularly craving carbohydrates, uh, decreased concentration, um, difficult having increased sleep and feeling um, like you need more sleep than usual, in fact, oversleeping in many instances, uh, moving a little more slowly than usual. Uh, and then, unfortunately, in many instances, feeling uh, a, a desire for suicide or hurting oneself. And so those are the symptoms of, the, of major depressive disorder. And what distinguishes um, that, that type of disorder as being seasonal affective or, or major depression with seasonal pattern is what the, the, the uh, clinical diagnosis is, is when it occurs, again, seasonally. So it's specifically when you have those symptoms during the fall and winter season and when it those symptoms completely abate 
during other parts of the year. Uh, and so that's what makes it seasonal affective disorder. Have you seen this uh, emerge in combination with other um, maladies, other illnesses people might uh, be uh, experiencing? Sure. Well, we do know that seasonal affective disorder, or as I mentioned, the clinical diagnosis being major depressive disorder uh, with seasonal pattern, is um, that we do see that it occurs more frequently in people who have other psychiatric di diagnoses. So whether we're talking about um, anxiety, um, certainly a person who has um, a bipolar disorder, which is another affective uh, disorder, uh, and then other, uh, other uh, psych psychiatric di diagnoses. Uh, we know, too, that because some people uh, who have other chronic conditions that may be more prone to, uh, to depression, uh, we may see that uh, occur uh, hand in hand. But the statistics really are showing more of an increase primarily in people who have other psychiatric di diagnoses. Uh, I'm wondering, and I know you spent a great deal of your career to date, you know, not training doctors, a lot of black and brown doctors. Um, does it hit our people differently? I'm wondering if there's any, any you have any thoughts about that? And, and our people, uh, in addition to, uh, as with other people, we do see that increased isolation, uh, increased sense of uh, not being able to do what, um, what we otherwise would like to do. Uh, for our families, um, but certainly the isolation is, is, a, is a large part of what we see among our people. The other challenge uh, is that because in our community, uh, mental health disorders often go uh, underdiagnosed or often not recognized, then we tend to see then it impact other areas of our lives. So our employment, uh, our social relationships and other interpersonal uh, relationships, both at work and at home. Uh, and so in that regard, it may affect uh, our community differently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, before we uh, open it up to the rest of our panel to, to ask him some questions and some observations, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on interventions or solutions that you've found effective over the years or that as you've, you know, kind of consulted with colleagues and, and brought folk into the conversation. A any, any thoughts on solutions for folks who are really hit by this? I mean, I can say myself, this is probably my least favorite time of year, and you, you do feel like you don't want to get out of bed, you, 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 you're overeating, this kind of I'm fascinated by this carbohydrates issue. But anyway, so t <laughs> what kind of solutions do you have in mind? Sure, sure. And I do just wanted to add to what you're saying is that um, we do notice that around the holidays in particular, mm. when we're used to gathering and having a wonderful time with our families, uh, that that is a time that we do um, see that this that it compounds that the uh, the sense of of of, of sadness and, and worthlessness, especially in cases where people have lost loved ones around mm. this time of year and are reflecting on that. But in terms of how we can manage it, uh, there are some therapies that we know do work, including uh, light boxes. So it's a uh, light box that emits uh, white light, um, but with very low emission of uh, ultraviolet light, uh, low to no uh, emission of ultraviolet light that is exposed, that the uh, person uses and is exposed to for about 20 or 30 minutes shortly after waking up, ideally before 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, that's one of the therapies. Um, certainly having uh, receiving therapy by a clinical um, a clinical therapist is helpful. Um, certainly, in some instances, taking a medication that helps to maintain the serotonin levels uh, better, which is one of the reasons that we have uh, are affected by seasonal affective disorders, because with that decreased sunlight, um, then we have decreased production of the um, of the serotonin, which is one of the, the chemicals in the brain that kind of helps us to feel better and imp improves mood. Uh, but so those are some of the things that from a therapeutic standpoint, but other things that we can do are to exercise. We know that exercise helps to increase the endorphins in the body, which also help us to feel better. They're kind of some of the happy hormones, so to speak. Uh, we know that eating well helps. Also exposure to natural sunlight during, although limited during this time of the year, to the extent that we can be exposed to natural sunlight, that does help. And in surrounding us with our social supports, those are all some of the things that we can do to help to manage the uh, symptoms of major depressive disorder with the seasonal uh, pattern. Thank you, Doc. I'm going to uh, open it up and ask uh, Brother Turan to, to begin the conversation with you. Turin, any thoughts? Any uh, questions or thoughts? 
Hello, Doc. Thank you for all this information. Um, I know I'm not a fan of the five, the midnight, the midnight at 5:30 thing that's been happening lately. I, I'm not a fan of it, and it does drain you. Um, my question is, how can people make um, this time of year beneficial for themselves? Is there a possibility that has there been any sort of correlation between like cold weather and like low sunlight and low lack of light? to boys people being productive in any way? Because I'm curious about that, because if people are in the house and everything, does that make them tend to be a little bit more productive or they just kind of like fold into isolation and hibernation at all? Have you seen any of that? Sure, well, the low light um, certainly does have a, a negative impact on um, on mood, uh, both because of the changes in those hormone levels, the serotonin levels, and some to some degree, the dopamine levels as well, which again, helped us to feel better. Uh, and also decreases uh, or changes the um, the amount of melatonin that we're uh, producing. And so you remember, or it increases the amount. Remember, melatonin is that chemical that really helps us to begin to feel a little sleepy. And so if you're having more of those, um, that, that hormone kind of circulating, then they tend to be more sleepy during the day and, um, and, less, and more sluggish. And so you may be less likely to be productive. Uh, th that is part of the reason why uh, increasing our social supports, trying to minimize that isolation really can uh, help to improve both our mood and then and thereby our productivity. We do know that mood has an impact on our productivity as well. Thank you, Turan. Uh, John Quell, any questions, observations, comments? Dr. Kelsey. Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. <laughs> Kelsey, for all this amazing um, information. Um, what I wanted to ask is historically, you know, African Americans have a limited have limited access to health care, right? And that's been a huge contributing factor as it relates to our morbidity or us being underdiagnosed for various different health conditions. Um, is that how does that correlate with the the actual cases that are being diagnosed, right? And also for for African Americans that do have a lack of access to health care, um, what what are what are the suggestions with them getting some help um, to deal with the winter blues, as another way that it's coined or termed? Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, and there, and thank you for that that question because access we do know is certainly an issue, and because of that, we see that among those who are not diagnosed, that they have more severe uh, symptoms and, and, a, and, a, and a greater impact in terms of their uh, their interactions with others, their employment, and so it has a greater impact when it goes undiagnosed and unmanaged. Uh, so, in terms of how we increase access. Uh, I can say in Atlanta, for example, uh, with Morehouse Healthcare and the Heal Clinic. Um, so that is uh, allows uh, people to, who do not have insurance or who are underinsured to be able to access healthcare. Uh, so in some of the in some of the other cities, it may be through um, through accessing the federally qualified health centers, which often are um, are excellent resources for those who otherwise wouldn't have access to healthcare. And so, um, but an important Part of that, though, really is recognizing it. And when we recognize the symptoms, not to um, just minimize them and say that it's only the winter blues, because again, this uh, disorder, the seasonal affective disorder, really can have some devastating impacts in one's life. Uh, in, in one's life. And so it's important to recognize it as a diagnosis that does require some treatment. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, John Quell. Lauren, Lauren, any, uh, any questions, comments? Doc, I wonder, is, has anybody looked at what they do with this in Alaska, where they have that period in a certain part of Alaska that is dark from November to January? In, in those cases, again, it's the, the light therapy. The light therapy uh, really mm -hmm. is, is what's uh, most helpful. And so, uh, so there is where there's actually a light box that um, that is is purchased and it has it emits um, well ten thousand lux of, of light uh, or, or thereabout and it's important though with that that it also um, minimizes the amount of UV light to help to decrease the uh, the risk of um, of skin cancer um, but still has the um, the beneficial effects of the light in terms of uh, affecting or improving the, the mood so that really is the um, is the best approach in places like in you know where where that there is 
there's little to no light, um, like you mentioned uh, in Alaska, where it goes days with, with no light. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lauren. Dr. Kelsey, uh, when I'm sure there are people who are, are, are watching who are saying, well, you know, you recommend eating well, I'm on a budget, I don't have a whole lot of money. I wonder if you have any recommendations on folk who might be challenged economically. When you say eating well, what kind of things can people consume that don't cost a whole lot of money but can help them in their moods? Because I'm, I'm sure it's not now, ladies, and uh, red pop, but I'm just <laughs> <Right>. wondering <laughs> what... Yes. So that's I, ideally we're talking about fresh fruits and vegetables. We're talking about um, water, uh, you know, drinking plenty of water and avoiding the the, um, the 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 sugary drinks or the highly processed foods. Uh, minimizing the intake of alcohol and um, and other drugs that can affect the mood uh, negatively. Okay. Uh, in terms of those who are have limited resources. Uh, to the extent, even if you have to um, use canned food, um, then you want to make sure that you're look, reading the labels and you're uh, limiting the amount of sodium that's added. You're limiting the amount of, of oils that are added and sugars that are added. And again, the processed foods are really the ones that we want to avoid. Uh, but fresh fruit, fruits and vegetables, ideally, and again, tapping into some of the resources that are in some communities that may provide uh, those um, those kinds of foods in, in instances where one may not otherwise be able to access it mm -hmm. by going and purchasing it from a grocery store, for example. Thank you. And one, one final question. This one relates to exercise and natural sunlight. For folks who may be under a lot of stress, they may be working one or two or three jobs trying to get through the season, running up those bills, trying to buy Kwanzaa gifts, and which you shouldn't be buying anyway, right? But we, we had, had had that Kwanzaa conversation another time, Christmas gifts. You know, they say, well, I don't have a lot of time. How much time... Mm -hmm. Or, or do you say might be enough to at least ameliorate some of these symptoms when it comes to getting some natural sunlight or, or, or doing some exercise? Sure. So for the natural sunlight, you know, we know that it's cold. And so going outside and in the natural and getting that natural sunlight uh, is something that people are generally not going to do as much. So even if you're inside working and you can sit near a window and, you know, open the curtains and sit, sit next to a window, that can be helpful in terms of providing that extra sun exposure. Uh, as far as the exercise is concerned, we recommend about 30 minutes of exercise um, per day. However, breaking it up into small segments, maybe 10 minutes at a time, if it's a little 10 minutes in the morning, um, 10 minutes during a break midday and 10 minutes in the evening may be uh, helpful. Now, that's good for cardiovascular health, but it's also good for uh, being for the release of those endorphins that help to improve the mood. Okay. And uh, how long? To 30 minutes, you can break it up. What kind of exercises? Yeah, so we're talking about moderate intensity exercise. So if you're going outside, that may be a, a little bit of a jog or it may be a fast paced, um, you know, a brisk walk. If you're inside the house, that may be walking the steps. It may be walking a circle, you know, within, you know, some part of the some part of the house. Uh, it may be uh, to those if for, the, for those who are able doing some squats, anything that kind of running, doing a little jogging in place. Anything that kind of helps to increase the heart rate uh, a bit so that you're um, just ju just before you get a little winded. Um, so <laughs> we think about that as being moderate intensity exercise. Okay. Um, that's the kind of exercise that's most beneficial. Well, thank you for joining us tonight on this, the shortest day of the year in the Northern Hemisphere. I'm sure we've all gotten some tips. And uh, it's not something that's too overburdened, as Dr. King might say, from right down the street there from where you are. How long? Not long. You can do a little bit of exercise, get you a little bit of a different diet, and you'll be okay. Reba Kelsey from Morehouse School of Medicine, thank you for joining us tonight, Dr. Kelsey. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Absolutely. So when we come back here on the Black Star Network, we're going to take a look at some headlines and uh, then move toward a conversation Roland Martin had with the gospel artist Doe. So you're watching Roland Martin and Filtered, in fact, on the Black Star Network, and we'll be right back. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. <laughs> White people are losing their damn minds. 
as an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Sherry Shebrit with Sammy Roman. I'm Dr. Robin B, pharmacist and fitness coach, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Angel Crosby Young has been missing from Bay City, Michigan since August 24, 2023. The 16-year-old is five feet, four inches tall, weighs 220 pounds, with black hair and brown eyes. Anyone with information about Angel Crosby Young is urged to call the Detroit, Michigan Police Department at 313-267-4600. A federal judge overturned the death penalty conviction of a Mississippi man because a trial judge didn't give the man's lawyer enough chance to argue the prosecution was dismissing black jur jurors for discriminatory reasons. U.S. District Judge Michael P. Mills ordered a new trial for Terry Pitchford, who was convicted in 2006 on capital murder charges. Mills wrote that his ruling is partially motivated by what he called former District Attorney Doug Evans' history of discriminating against black jurors. A spokesperson for Mississippi Attorney General Lynn Fitch said the state intends to appeal. Well, there's certainly no uh, surprise there in the state of Mississippi. Attorneys for the two Colorado paramedics connected to the 2019 death of Elijah McClain told the jury that their clients followed in, uh, they followed their training in administering, uh, administering rather ketamine and prosecutors have not proven that the sedative is what killed him. Peter uh, Chichunyek and Jeremy Cooper, two former members of the Aurora Fire Department, were called to the scene on August 24, 2019 to help McLean with a medical emergency. Cooper injected McLean with large amounts of ketamine, resulting in symptoms of an overdose. Uh, Chichunyek and Cooper are two out of the five authorities charged in the homicide of McLean. Randy Rodema, was found guilty of criminally negligent homicide and third degree assault and will be sentenced in January. Jason Rosenblatt and Nathan Woodyard, as we uh, reported here on Roland Martin Unfiltered, were, were acquitted. And Ro they, uh, Rosenblatt was acquitted of all charges. A Georgia jury convicts an Atlanta lawyer of defrauding the federal government out of more than $7 million in Paycheck Protection Program funds. A jury of seven men and five women found Shalitha Robertson used the funds to buy a Rolls Royce, Royce car, Lord have mercy, a motorcycle and 10 carat diamond ring for $148,000, among other things. Robertson denied grossly exaggerating the number of people employed by four of her companies to obtain millions of dollars in federal aid designed to help small businesses keep afloat during the cor cor coronavirus pandemic. She blamed her company's fraudulent 2020 PPP loan applications on her then friend and personal attorney, Chandra Norton, who pled guilty in a separate prosecution. Prosecutors said that Robertson and Norton were best friends and partners in crime, who together schemed to get as much money in PPP loans as they could, receiving ultimately almost $8 million. Robertson transferred 50,000 in PPP funding to her daughter, who has not been charged, withdrew $25,000 of the funds in cash and gave Norton $400,000. Prosecutors said 
Well, well, well. Jack Quell, have you ever seen something like this in the courtrooms that you've been in? I mean, was this, a, was this a case of where they was both guilty and one turned on the other one before the other one could get the deal? Are you smiling? What, what, what do you make of this? During the course of the pandemic, there's been tons of people that have been prosecuted due to the improper use of these PPP loans. So this is certainly something that has come up quite a bit since the pandemic. Um, however, what makes it odd is that you have two lawyers, um, unfortunately, that um, are involved in this case. And you're right, um, attorney, well, uh, Ms. Norton has been disbarred, but she took a plea back in 2020 where um, an agreement with an agreement to uh, testify um, against uh, Ms. Robertson. Um, and so, um, unfortunately, this is something that has commonly went on since the uh, PPP loans have been given out, and it's really unfortunate uh, and, and while, we, while we're talking about it, I, don't, I hope you don't mind if I ask you right quick about these uh, these challenges, these peremptory challenges and voir dire challenges and what looks to be a turn back based on this Batson uh, challenge in the Mississippi case. Any thoughts about jury selection process and how this case in Mississippi shows what happens? Yes, yes. So if the prosecution brings the motion, then it's a Batson, cha Batson challenge. But if the defense attorney brings the motion, it's called a McCullum challenge. Mm -hmm. And so essentially, um, it, it's, it's very, very important, right? Because during the course of selecting a jury, we're it's a deselection process, right? So you want to, as an attorney, you want to get rid of those jurors that you don't want on the jury. However, um, during the course of making those deselections, if in fact there's uh, anything that stands out where there's a specific race, right? It looks like that you're essentially excluding all of the African, in this case, all of the African-American jurors, um, the, either side is entitled to that motion. And, and that's important because it forces the prosecution, it, it's required that on the record, the prosecution is supposed to give a race neutral reason for the for them um, the deselection or um, for the excusal of these jurors, and if they if it is not a legitimate reason, the court is to reinstate that juror back on the jury, hmm. and it's 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 very important um, to the criminal justice system because you have a constitutional right to a fair and impartial jury, and so. Um, the court was right to overturn that case, and, and, and it, it's very, very important. Um, during the course of um, my time um, as a prosecutor, uh, I've had those challenges against me, and I've raised those challenges against defense counsel, mm. right? Because, I mean, it's an, it's important. I mean, you're entitled to a jury of your peers, mm -hmm. and, it, and it has to be a legitimate reason for the excusal of those juries. Mm -hmm. So I am glad to see to see that case be overturned. Oh, absolutely. Well, I, I tell you, it seems like Mississippi is the gift that keeps on giving in these cases. I mean, it's like, really, is this what we're talking about now? Uh, Turan, any thoughts on any of those headlines that we had today? I was thinking about even particularly thinking about Elijah McClain case, no, no movement on it. But these paramedics trying to get off by saying that they did their job, but maybe their training failed or, or any, any of the other uh, headlines that we had today. Well, um, as far as the Elijah McCain situation, I, part of me kind of wonders are these um, two para, ex paramedics being um, considered scapegoats because hmm. by the time you, I, and I don't know the procedures in that city, whether you call the cops first and then you call the paramedics when there's a situation like that, but I don't know if the cops who were on the scene were able to call the paramedics and say, well, this is what's going on. But even then, even then, I don't know how you can have somebody give you a determination if you are a paramedic when you don't check for yourself. And ketamine, I don't even understand why he was even injected with ketamine if there was a, if there was a medical situation that they hadn't determined. I'm not saying that they're not at fault. That's up for a jury to decide. But I think there needs to be a lot more investigation into this by just saying, is this these five, all, this, these five um, public service officials? I wonder how far up the chain these sort of things go. And I wonder how long these sort of policies have been in place for people who have been involved in police-involved situations, or even just what the procedures are for somebody who they figure is, quote-unquote, low class or low income or whatever that looks like. And as far as the other headlines, yeah, I'm in Atlanta, and that that um that that PPP loan story has been the joke for the past three or four days. It's <laughs> like you mentioned you mentioned the Rolls Royce. Well, she didn't just get a Rolls Royce; well, she got a hot pink Rolls Royce. And what? in my head, 
What? Oh yeah, it was a hot, it was a hot pink Rolls Royce. Come on. And part of me is wondering, was she riding around Atlanta with her arm out the window, like playing UGK or by, by playing pink and ring by UGK, thinking nobody was gonna pay attention to that? I mean, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what got in her head to make her think she was going to do that. It's, it's sad. It's funny, but it's sad. Because yeah. you would think somebody who's a lawyer would have better sense than to do this. But, you know, it's just one of the things, man, you just got to shake your head as to why people move the way they move. No question. I mean, who she thinks she is? Marjorie Taylor Greene? You can't just steal federal money and get away with it. Which actually, <laughs> which actually <laughs> Lauren, you know, I saw you laughing because, I mean, you see this stuff up close every day in the federal legislature. All this stealing and some people get away scot-free. And then this other thing. I wonder if you have any thoughts about this. I'm, the word that comes to mind as, as we're sitting here and I'm thinking about you and, and the things you've reported on over the years and you talk about every week here is accountability. Clarence Thomas clearly doesn't have any accountability. Matt Gates and Margie Taylor Greene can take millions. These sisters are going to pay for what they did. I mean, what, what kind of country are we living in now where it seems like some people are always brought to accountability as they should be and others don't even have to think about it? Yeah, that's that's for sure. Uh, obviously, accountability is really up to who gets to decide who will be uh, accountable. Mm. And mm. it's not that it's right to steal a bunch of PPP money and, and buy a pink Rolls Royce. She should have gotten busted for that. But the PPP money situation uh, has been very interesting. There have been a lot of people who have who had gotten a lot of that money under very questionable circumstance. So it then becomes a matter of who gets who gets busted. Uh, and, uh, I mean, you know, as somebody who walked out of the Jonathan Majors case uh, mm. this week, uh, you know, you see that prosecutorial decision-making and discretion means a lot. And so when Alvin Bragg picks that case over another one, you know, you have to wonder. And jury selection in that case was an issue as, as well, uh, where in the closing days of the case, the only black juror on the jury, uh, the prosecution tried to throw out, <laughs> tried oh. to throw off of the case, which it was interesting to be sitting in Manhattan in criminal court that you only had one black juror. Uh, and then the one black juror that you do have, we're going to try to get rid of. So, I mean, jury selection and, uh, the, you know, there had been some, some bats and challenges in another case that Alvin Bragg had prosecuted involving Adam Foss, a totally different case from the, the Majors case. So jury selection is huge. Now, of course, we know that some of that is because people do not necessarily answer their jury notices. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not all the court's fault necessarily. But when you look in detail at, and, and so many uh, social and civil rights groups have looked at this, when you look at detail, the jurors who do show up and the ones that get stricken are disproportionately black because, of course, there's this notion that black people cannot be uh, objective even though the history shows us exactly the opposite, uh, there's always this idea that white folks will walk in the court and be completely and perfectly objective, and it's black folks that can't be objective about a, a, a black defendant. At any rate, uh, after watching the Majors case, I, I have to say that, uh, I mean, <laughs> in some ways it feels like the 1950s are here again, because mm. there's certain things that you see that mirror some of the history that you've read about, and I, as a history major, recognize and I'm kind of shocked by, particularly when it comes to our justice system. But at any rate, um, there's a lot to say about those headlines. I think I've probably talked long enough <laughs> about, no. about uh, the situation. But, you know, th it is interesting, the pink cattle, the pink Rolls Royce, not Cadillac, pink Rolls Royce. <laughs> that is, that's pretty audacious, pretty bold. Pretty so audacious. You do it all the way. <laughs> well, you yeah. know those ATLians, as they might say, me and you, your mama and your cousin, too. <laughs> so, I mean, going to slam some yeah. doughs, but, you know, somebody got to pay for their fun. But really, though, for those who may not have missed your coverage or may have missed your coverage and commentary on the Jonathan Majors case, I would encourage them to go back to the Black Star Network app or YouTube or wherever you consume Black Star Network and look at your coverage from being in the cl in the courtroom and what you put it in context, because I didn't see that any anywhere else, reported anywhere else in terms of, of mass media. Um, of course, as always, the Thursday panel, thank you, Lauren Victoria Burke, Black Press Thanks. USA, uh, John Quill Neal from the John Quill Neal Law Firm there in Atlanta, and Brother Terran Walker, all as always, the founder of Context Media. Thank you all for joining us today, and we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we are actually going to sit with our brother Roland Martin as he sits down with award-winning gospel artist Doe. 
who participated in the McDonald's Inspiration Celebration Gospel Tour. So we're going to talk, uh, he's going to talk to Doe, and we're going to listen when we come back from the break here at Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Back in a moment. Grow your business or career with Grow with Google's wide range of online courses, digital training, and tools. Gain in-demand job skills with flexible online training programs designed to put you on the fast track to jobs in high growth fields. No experience is necessary. Learn at your own pace. Complete the online certificate program on your own terms. Stand out to employers, get on a path to in-demand jobs, and connect with top employers who are currently hiring. Take one professional career certificate program or all six. Earn a Google career certificate to prepare for a job in a high growth field like data analytics, project management, UX design, cybersecurity, and more. All professional career certificate programs must be completed by December 31st, 2024. Scan the QR code to complete the application. There are 1,000 scholarships available. Grow with Google and J. Hood and Associates. Be job ready and qualify for in-demand jobs. Our brother Roland sat down with award-winning gospel artist Doe, who participated in McDonald's Inspiration Celebration Gospel Tour to find out how she got started singing. Here is Roland's conversation with Doe at Chicago's House of Hope. Doe, I'm doing good. Thank you for having me. All right, so I first uh, I had a, a Lafayette woman. Now I have another... Uh, That's right. Another Louisiana. Louisiana. But, but well, is, there, is it... Okay, because the uh, the name is always interesting. Yeah. Uh, some people say Shreveport, and okay. some say Shreveport. Shreveport. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I say Shreveport because I was actually raised up until I was 14, 15 in Yakima, Washington. Oh, Ooh, so Lord, I, that's, that was a culture it, shift. It was. Yes. Absolutely. Lord, why don't study? Shock, yes. Yeah, yeah, culture shock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Washington State to Shreveport, Louisiana. How did that happen? What happened? Um, it was really just a God thing, and, and my dad connected with a pastor in Shreveport and then was a, a staff pastor there, and so our whole family, mom, all five of us kids, moved down there and became a part of this high school and their culture and their church, and it was, yeah, we just, we jumped all the way in. <laughs> All the way in. Yeah. yeah, that's a whole different experience yep. uh, from Washington State. It is. I mean, even like the sports that are important in those two different regions. We went from basketball to a football family. Oh, yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? Texas, Louisiana is football. It's football, yeah. So Other sports, they actually, that's just that's training for football. Yeah. That's how I look at it. You right. Ask about, no, that's just go get your conditioning in. Absolutely. Like, yeah, yeah. It's open. That's how I think about it. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. It was a it was a massive culture shift. So for you now, what's interesting is that you're solo now, but it's not how it started for you. No. So where did the gospel begin? Where where did where did that start in terms of uh, uh the group? How did that yeah. even start? Yeah, I mean, you know, dad's a pastor. He's he his family was musical growing up. We started we were musical. Uh, my father wrote the song, I don't know if you heard it, but it's called Use Me. And that song did really well. And so him and my mom would travel everywhere, all around the world, singing and ministering. But one day he was like, I feel like I'm supposed to travel with my family now. So we started playing. We were already playing. Like, and he would wake us up for prayer every morning and we would get on our instruments and play. So we were already doing that. But he was like, I want to do, I want to do this. So he had a free band. This. He had a free band. <laughs> He paid in food <laughs> and, and a, food and had a warm place to sleep. There you go. There you go. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. So that's how we did it, you know. And um, now what instrument did you play? I play play keys and guitar. Okay. Yeah. And the microphone. <laughs> I play the <laughs> microphone too. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, everybody played. I mean, even my sister, when she got married, her husband was a part of the group because he played. So the family of family. Yeah, like a mini Winans. Like yes. you coming to the you know family, what? you're going you gonna play a scene. Can I I wanna say thank you for that because I would rather them say that than is your dad Joe Jackson? Are you guys like the Joe? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I like that comparison. <laughs> 
Yeah. Well, well, but, but yeah, because it, it's interesting. Be look, you mad because that family? Um, come on, come on, come on, get to work, <laughs> get get to work. Grab this phone, take this, take this picture. The family business is get this social media video. <laughs> yeah. So that's what it is. Okay. So y'all, so so y'all begin the tour as a family, and then when did it become y'all a group? Uh, immediately it was like that. And actually it, it really was like, even moving to Shreveport was a series of divine appointments because the pastor introduced us to this guy who needed the ministry of a family. And we benefited from our connection with him because he became our manager. And it was just this beautiful exchange. When you say he needs the ministry of a family, what does that mean? Um, he had just gone through some tough things in life and just seeing a family mm -hmm. operate was ministry to him and it just was beautiful to him and he you know so he was like we people have to see you guys doing your thing on well, well most people what, what was interesting about that is that most people don't realize that uh real pastors don't count members yeah they count families because oh, people right. individuals are transient they they, they come and go but yeah. typically when a family yeah. joins a church they're there. They're investing, and, and it's and it's and typically we've multiple generations, so they grow yeah. up there. They might they get they get married there. They yeah. they have kids there, and right. so so a lot of preachers focus on I have X number of families. Yeah, at I mean, my church. multi uh, generations is like a sign of a healthy church too. You know, everybody's represented there, and everybody gets along. That's a big deal. <laughs> so we had that there at that church, and. So Jeffrey Benmer became our manager. He introduced us to Tommy Sims, who produced our first record. And then we pitched that record to EMI Gospel at the time, which is now Motown Gospel. Mm -hmm. And we got signed, and it did very well. And then you decided, you know what? I want to do my own thing. And then we did another album that didn't do so well. And then we got dropped, and we kept singing. And then I was youth pastoring and just doing whatever and uh, and then I decided I'm I'm ready. How was that what was that process because obviously when you are again you mentioned earlier you know Joe Jackson when <laughs> when, when 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 Michael decides to lead the Jackson 5 to become a solo artist yeah. um there, there are other examples of that as well. I mean it's 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 a whole different dynamic because you're used to operating and moving as a group. Yeah. I think I put obligations on myself um, because I was one of the like main lead singers and, and writers along with my dad, everybody wrote. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think I, I took on the weight of, I have to take care of my family. I imagine being in your twenties carrying that or right. thinking our album didn't do that well because of me or whatever, just ways that I believe the enemy wants to keep you in bondage, however he can from mm -hmm. moving forward. So that was a year's worth of a process of realizing um, that I also had even a skewed vision of, um, you know, fearing missing God's will. And it was just like all so wrong because when I finally said, hey, I'm moving in Dallas to go do what's in my heart <laughs> at 29 years old, they were all just like, we've been waiting on you. Mm. You know what I mean? So you're, you're wrestling with all this stuff Internally, they're like, and it's a hot time. time, right? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and so, you're going, why y'all didn't say nothing? Um, I think they tried to say, you know, but that voice is just so loud of obligation that you know. So, anyways, I I had three college degrees, but I was like, I'm not going to Dallas to get a job and ask for permission to leave work mm. to do what's in my heart. So I got my Uber license, and I was like, if this doesn't work out. I could do this. I mean, Uber and Lyft, they're like, you're, you own your own business, your own little, you know? Right, yeah. So, but I honestly only had to drive, had to drive twice in the two years of being in Dallas to pay my rent because my friends knew I led worship. I grew up with people who ended up pastoring big churches and doing these big conferences. And they were like, can you come? And it just was like one thing after the other, word of mouth, um, getting on, doing cycles with Jonathan, getting on Israel Houghton's, album who was a hero of mine and just like and then doing something with Maverick and honestly it was like God created the perfect storm around my yes around my willingness to s jump jump and watch these wings that I made for you work see I think for a lot of people when people ask 
me all the time, they'll ask, um, like, how did this happen? And what most people don't realize is that if you ask any successful, especially an entrepreneur, someone who actually did their own thing, yeah, they had to have absolute faith, not only in God, but in themselves. Yeah. And that's the thing. There are some people who have faith in God, but they mm -hmm. actually don't have faith in themselves that was to actually mm -hmm. pull the trigger. Yep. And you said absolute faith. And to me, that speaks volumes because that means there's nothing happening around me that is uh, tangibly saying, this is going to happen for you. No. But absolute faith in myself and God. And that's, that's what that season was. And it was so scary. But I had a friend say to me, if you don't do what's in your heart, I feel like, um, I feel like you're going to be the man in the Bible with one talent because mm -hmm. you had a skewed vision of how God sees you and how the father operates with his children. But there's also patience. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, I think, see, a lot of people talk about that, that verse. Yeah. But then I have to take people to Habakkuk. Okay. Where it says, write the vision down, make it plain, then wait. Yeah. And that's the other thing. Yes. So I, I may remember God laid out, you're going to be doing all of these things in media, July 2000. I'm like, all right, let's go. He's like, no, no. I'm yes. like, hold on, what you mean? I'm yes. like, I'm ready to roll. No, I have to move some people into position mm -hmm. who right now are not in position. Yeah. And as I look back on that, some of those people it took a decade for them to be put in position. Yes. And that's, I think, also hard for people. Yes. The waiting part. Yes. Because sometimes it comes fast, but then yeah. sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. So here's why the yes period is so scary is because you have been obedient and saying no for 10 years. And then all of a sudden, you don't hear God saying, don't take this opportunity, not yet. And that was so scary for right. me. I had an anxiety attack the night that I decided I was going to sign with uh, the label I'm with. Really? Because I was so used to being in this holding pattern. And the waiting is good because you're also being, you're, you're getting rid of any ambition in you to kick doors down and I'm gonna make it happen on my right. own, on my terms. You know what I'm saying? Yep. So it's good for you. But when the yes season comes, it is scary because you're so used to, God told me to wait. And then you don't feel that anymore. You feel this freedom to go and you feel the command to go, but you're like, I don't, I, I've been saying no. Well, what's crazy for me was having this tremendous skill set and knowing I have financial needs, applying for positions that I could do in my sleep and none of them happening. And it's like, right. like literally, I could do that in my sleep. Doors closed. I, I remember I had one radio station, and this was, um, and, and they, they were like, why are you applying for this job? Mm -hmm. I mean, you've done all these things, but it was actually a style of radio that I had never done. And they couldn't just fathom the idea that I actually wanted to learn how to do that style. And, and I, I'm looking at them going, this is a no-brainer. Right. Somebody with my resume mm -hmm. never got the offer. Yeah. And then you're sitting there kind of like, say, bro, um, can you let me know what's up? Because life got to get paid. Yeah. And that's the thing. You know, everybody's like, oh, the industry's changing. you change. I'm telling you that it will always be about who you know. And the who that I'm talking about is the one that closes doors that should obviously be open for you mm -hmm. because it's not his time. It's not his season. And, and now look, <laughs> you know, it's like we're here because the timing was right. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. When you, I asked, I've asked other artists this question. Where do you see your place in gospel music? Where do, where, where do you, because they, they, obviously there are different genres within the gospel. Yeah, there. So you're like, what genre am I? For you, yeah. how do you see yourself? In this space? I have to say that Reese, if you had asked me that maybe a month ago, I would have just said, yeah, I'm a part of the, you know, evolving sound of, um, you know, with the guitar and neo soul, that's probably where I am. Um, but I actually see uh, um, an even greater evolution with my music now because we're working on my album. And, um, and I kind of feel like 
yes, the neo soul thing will always be a part and the worship thing will always be a part of who I am. But I feel like I'm writing more um, R&B feel and folk right now. I know that those are two like on opposite spectrums, but those sounds are in me because my parents just had us listening to everything, mm -hmm. every different sound. We couldn't listen to secular, but every different expression of Got music, it. you know, so... That's that's what I would say. And there are some young like uh, R and B gospel artists coming up, like Jordan Armstrong. Um, I mean, Erica Campbell still represents in that genre. Mm -hmm. but, so I, I actually would like to see um, what my music would do even outside of like church. Mm -hmm. You know. So what, what I think it was interesting about the lineup of uh, this McDonald's tour mm -hmm. is that you have. Uh, just these different, it's just so many different types of sounds yeah. that for those who are going to be uh, attending in these cities, uh, they're getting a broad view as opposed to, you know, sort of six artists who are sort of in the same vein. Yeah, they, they had a buffet. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, when you, you know the, I don't know what I was saying, but you know the buffets at the casino, how they got Italy over here. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mexican food over here. I mean, literally, you're right. I mean, there's a plethora of, of different genres within the genre of gospel music mm -hmm. being represented here. And I love that because we're colorful people, you know? Egg, 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 and again, and have range. We have and that's range. And you know what else? I'm going to say this might get me off subject, but I'm also loving how Afro vibes are, you know what I'm saying, being highlighted right now because it's unifying brown skinned people mm. in the United States. And also, I mean, you can hear it in reggaeton or like in the in the Spanish culture, but yep. that's also our influence yep. in there. So there's this there's this broad like stroke being painted right now, saying this is black world right. music, and I love that. So you mentioned that, then you you mentioned uh, your parents that they listen to everything but secular. Okay, so I'm yeah, so you're out. like, what is that? <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna throw this out. So because uh, 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 Bree failed this test. Oh no! I, I, threw, I threw a couple. I'm I threw, gonna fail. No, 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 no. Okay. See, I, 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 I threw. A, I threw. A, I mentioned a couple of names. She's like, "Who is that?" Okay. And I was like, "Are you serious?" All right. And so then she's like, she told. She told me I can't ask his a car. I can't ask the athlete. She's like, "Oh no, she's not gonna know those." Uh, so, okay. So, so she know. She's probably right. That's what she said. So I. So I. I so I mentioned um, the, the Commodores hit Zoom. The what? The com <laughs> See, you never heard of Zoom? The Commodores hit song Zoom. Okay, she's right about that one. Okay, yeah. uh, how about uh, so I it, meetings on Zoom? Uh, yeah, meetings. Uh, really? You got meetings on Zoom? Really? <laughs> really? Sorry, really? Ah, oh my God! Give me. <laughs> so then I mentioned Jeffrey Osborne and LTD, and she was like, "Who in the world is that?" Maybe if you sing a song. See that? See so so when I threw out, you when know, we played a couple of the songs, she's like, "Oh yeah, I heard that." But she, but, she, but she had no idea what that meant. And I told her I was, she, she was struggling so bad, I told her, I said, I'm going to put your black card in review status. Please don't put me in card review status. <laughs> please, please, God. I work so hard. Especially in Washington State. <laughs> yes. Please, God, please. Okay. It is hard. You, you got me tempted to act like I know. <laughs> Silly right there. That's yeah. why. I'm, I'm like, I said, look, if you're paying, playing everything. Right. I, you're right. I have to say, when I'm with my friends and they know, because I have another friend who was a pastor's kid. She wasn't allowed to, but she played catch up. She took some years and caught up on everything. <laughs> so she knows. Yeah, I missed it, you know, because I was in my prayer closet. <laughs> <laughs> Do you at least know Frankie Beverly Mays? Wait. Is it you make me happy? Yes. Yes. Ooh. I let you go. You know why? Because we were listening to that this morning. I know it. I knew it before this morning. Got it. But today I saw the name and I was like, I don't remember that name. Yeah, please. See, the Holy Spirit had my back today. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Because, see, I ain't trying to have you in a setting where black people are playing spades or something and they throw out Frank and Billy Mays. You'd be like, oh. Right. Oh. Mm -hmm. And then the whole room will look at you like, who invited her? You're right. I'm going to do my homework, though. Yes. Just don't ask me if I play spade. <laughs> Excuse me. You don't. You don't, 
No, okay, I signed up for a class that I'm taking. You, you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't play spades? No, because here's why. Let me just say this. There is a part of black culture that grew up in church, and when they were growing up, playing cards was of the devil. Y'all couldn't even play cards? I could, but they couldn't, so they didn't grow up teaching their, they didn't teach their kids to play spades. Oh, okay. You know what I'm saying? Goldfish? Yes. Uno? Yes. But no spades. No spades. But I'm. I have had conversations, and where <laughs> I'm going to learn how to play spades very recently. <laughs> so this obviously has come up in other it's in come other up a lot. Yeah. But I did know that song that I just sang, so I don't think my card should go into review. The committee's looking at it right now. It's, I got I, I got deck of cards in my backpack. Yeah. See, so if see, I, we were to play at any given time. I can do other things too. I can do other things. I can make cornbread. <laughs> I can do other things. What else? What else can you do? Wait, wait. What I can play, you do? While, what can you do while, while we play spades? Listen to um, making the, the commoners in Zoom. Making green. Okay, I got it. You okay. know what I'm saying? I could do all of those things. I'm the nurturing black woman. <laughs> I will be that person. So you got you got the food straight got down. Yes, and I can talk trash. You know See, that, that comes in handy with That's space. That's what I'm saying, I see. I mean, space is totally about, it's not just learning how it's to play. It's one-on-one. The trash talking trash is talk. 80% of space. I kill trash talk. But you got to know how to play the trash talk. That's what I'm saying. So I'm 80% there, so I, my card shouldn't go in review. I'm just like. Okay. We're getting there. Yeah, we're getting there. Yeah. We're getting, yeah, we, whew, <laughs> might take a while, but uh, yeah, yeah, we're. 20% left. Yeah, we're. <laughs> Just 20% left. <laughs> yes, we're getting there. Last question for you. Okay. Who would you love to do something with? Um, I think, you know, right now, I got to sing uh, for CeCe Winans at the Stellar Award. Mm -hmm. And she's somebody that I, I genuinely would love to sit under, even if I was just singing a song with her. Gotcha. But I feel like she's somebody whose name still is so clean and she's such a, she's, people still hold her in high regard mm -hmm. after all of these years. And um, and she's a, a mother, she's a wife. And so I, I guess I would like to interview her and just ask her how, and then sit there with a notepad and write. Okay, well no, if, if you're doing the interview, you don't have to do the notepad because record it. Cameras. Yes. That way, you, that, you, that way you can listen. Right. You can just rewatch it. You can just play it back. You're right. You're right. Yeah. yeah I, I'm, I've, I've done this a little bit. Yeah. I'm, You're a pro. Just since I was 14. The, really? Yeah. Since you were 14. Went to communications high school. Do you have a book out here? Five books. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I'm fired. I'm not fired. <laughs> <laughs> You're never gonna call me back in for an interview When I come back, I'll know spades. I promise you. <laughs> yeah. With no spades, they only read the books. <laughs> yeah, right. And all the books. Yeah. No, that's really great. Oh yeah. Thank you for your contribution. It's all good. To the industry. All good. Yeah. Good chatting with you. Same. Look forward to uh, seeing you uh, on tour uh, and of course and uh, playing spades um, backstage. Oh yes, and beating you. That's not gonna happen. It's okay. <laughs> See, trash talk. That's not going to happen. Yeah, this trash talk, though. I'm going to send you back to Washington State. Excuse me? <laughs> I, I ain't going back to Washington State. You sit back. I don't want to go I'm back. so bad. you like, I'm packing up. I got to go. <laughs> and this no. man is too much. Right. That's it. I'll go back to Shreveport. <laughs> they'll patch me back <laughs> up. Yeah, they'll patch me back up. <laughs> All right, then. We well, appreciate it. It's an honor to meet you. Likewise. Yeah.